Okay. I was on mute. Sorry, everyone. Happens to the best of us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Electricity Association's conversation webinar series. The Canadian Electricity Association is the voice of the electricity industry in Canada. My name is Alex Kent. I am a manager of regulatory affairs and grid infrastructure here at CEA, and I am pleased to be your host for today's webinar. The conversation series features presentations from CEA's corporate partners and highlights a variety of Canadian and international solutions to current and future challenges faced by the industry. Working with CEA's corporate partners, these webinars have been developed to be of specific interest to those working in the electrical utility space from generation on through to the customer. For a list of upcoming sessions, please check out CEA's website at www.electricity.ca. These webinars allow a broad national audience, yourselves, to participate at no low cost without the need to travel or invest a lot of time. We are broadcasting from Ottawa to over 25 locations across Canada today. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. Our session is scheduled to run from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time sharp. Questions can be asked and we encourage you to do so as they come to mind by typing them into the chat function on your screen. They will be asked at the end of the presentation. Please set your device and devices to mute. A brief survey will be sent to webinar participants following the session today. We would very much appreciate your candid feedback and are interested in any topics you would like to have included in future conversation series webinars. Please keep an eye out for future webinars and events through CEA's monthly newsletter, Current Affairs. With over 6,000 subscribers, Current Affairs is the place to go for Canadian industry news as we connect the national value chain from generation on through to the customer. If you would like to receive Current Affairs, you can subscribe for free by CEA's website. Again, that is electricity.ca. Today's topic is understanding wood pole performance and equivalent composite pole selection. The presenting corporate partner is RS Technologies. And for a brief description of the presentation, as utilities to, con as utilities to continue to demonstrate increased demand for resilient grid hardening infrastructure, one challenge is the selection of a true wood equivalent composite pole, as many are under the misconception that composite poles deflect more than wood poles. Drawing on references from recently published second edition of the ASCE MOP 104 on FRP composite poles, this presentation quantifies actual wood pole deflection under load and how to select a serviceability equivalent covering both strength and deflection requirements for composite based poles on a methodology referred to as a deflection premium, which is based on mean wood pole deflection values. Your presenter today is Galen Fecht, the VP Director of Technical Service and International Sales. Uh, Galen, I will now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you to the CEA for the opportunity to present today to its uh, members and the attendees of this webinar. Um, moving into the presentation without any further delay. So, as Alex said, we are looking today to understand wood pole performance and equivalent composite pole selection. Moving into a brief history, a brief overview, my apologies, of the presentation, we're going to look at a history of wood poles and strength testing. Uh, the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute 05.1 uh, wood pole values, which includes the modulus of elasticity. Deflection definition, so explaining what exactly deflection is for those not familiar with it. A brief introduction to composite poles, actual wood pole test results, serviceability equivalency definition, and then a deflection premium calculation. So to start, let's take a look at a brief early timeline of the electric utility industry. So way back in 1880, electricity was invented. And uh, quickly, in the ensuing eight years, there were about 200 centralized generation facilities. In 1891, both the Canadian Electricity Association and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers were founded. Uh, and a brief timeline of other uh, notable parties in the industry, like the IEEE being founded in 1897. Okay, Alex. 
So the history of wood poles, uh, they've been used at almost, uh, for almost 140 years in overhead electrical utility lines. And believe it or not, for over 175 years in uh, telegraph and telephone systems. In researching uh, the internet for this presentation, I came across the photo on the left and uh, had a small aneurysm, I think, in taking a look at it. Um, this, of course, is not an electrical overhead line. This is a sample of a telegraph uh, pole situation here with about 25 cross arms. Okay. And uh, just for those familiar with the pole installation process, uh, that's also involved uh, a lot in the last 100 or so years. This is a photo from uh, 1917 of the Swiss Army putting up a pole in the mountains. So getting into wood pole testing. Uh, as poles began to get more usage and more things attached to them, uh, that led to a better understanding of the load cases and uh, specifically what uh, comprises those load cases, things like span, conductor size, number of conductors, wind load, ice load, so on and so forth, um, and the resulting wood pole performance requirements. Along the way, uh, full-scale bend test protocols were developed. Uh, one such example of that that we're most familiar with here in North America is the ASTM D1036. And this is a test protocol for wood poles in the horizontal uh, orientation. And this is an example that you see here, uh, a photo of a wood pole being tested here in Canada. Okay. So how do we characterize these wood poles? Um, so with the bend testing, that enabled the characterization of the this pole product. Um, that led to defined mean fiber strength and MOE or modulus of elasticity values on different wood pole species. And the resulting values are published in the ANSI 05.1 wood pole classes uh, table here. And a class one wood pole, uh, for example, needs uh, to be able to carry a tip load or have a tip load capacity of 4,500 pounds. Okay. And so with all that testing across various wood pole species, these ANSI 05.1 specifications came into being. So as we've highlighted here, a 50 foot Western red cedar pole uh, to achieve a class one rating, if you will, needs a minimum circumference at the pole tip of 27 inches and a circumference six feet from the butt of the pole of 49.5 inches. And as long as a 50 foot pole meets that criteria, it is classified as being a class one wood pole capable of handling that 4,500 pound tip load capacity. Okay, Alex. So what exactly is deflection? Well, that's defined as the movement of the pole tip as a result of an applied load, either transverse and or longitudinal. What you're seeing here on the slide is a finite element analysis model and this is from Powerline Systems or PLS software, where a pole model is built and then a load is applied. In this case, in the graphic on the right, you can see that uh, they've applied both the transverse and the longitudinal loads, and you can see the movement of the pole tips in both of those directions. Okay. And why is deflection important? Well, for one, we need to maintain minimum ground clearance requirements, which particularly are important at things like road crossings, railway crossings, and things like that. So you have enough uh, space underneath for vehicles and trains, et cetera. Um, and for right of way border zone clearance requirements, will, which of course will inform uh, your vegetation management schedules and strategies. Um, so when these poles deflect, if you will, either longitudinally or transverse, that conductor can come closer to the ground, if you will, and swing out. And in the photo on the right there, you'll see that those are suspension insulators. Uh, if the pole tip is moving too far to one side, those deflection, uh, those uh, suspension insulators, pardon me, can swing out even further and the conductor can, can move even further into the border zone. So this is why we wanna be cognizant of deflection performance. Um, additionally, pole deflection can also build resiliency into the line in high load situations like ice and windstorms, uh, hurricanes and what have you. Okay, Alex? However, there are some clearance issues that are no fault of the line designer or pole deflection, as you can see here in this uh, dump truck incident where it looks like this fellow had uh, the bucket up and was trying to exit the site uh, without realizing how high he was riding. So a brief introduction into composite poles here. So composite poles are comprised of a fiber 
and a resin that holds it together. So the fiber is where the pole derives its strength from, and the resin is the glue, if you will, that transfers the stress to the fibers. The first installations of composite poles were over 50 years ago, and today they're used in both transmission and distribution applications up to 345 kV globally. So a bit about pole material and stiffness. So as you're probably aware, uh, like covered in, the, in one of the first slides of the wood pole and test fixture, wood poles do deflect when a tip load is applied. Uh, additionally, steel and concrete poles will also deflect under a tip load, not quite as much as wood, but they still do deflect. Composite poles have the highest specific strength, which is strength per unit of weight. However, they have lower stiffness than steel, concrete, and wood poles. So all things being considered, the same strength composite pole will deflect more than a wood pole with the same tip load. Now this is what we're going to address because composite poles can also be engineered to have higher stiffness to perform congruently or homogeneously with wood poles. Okay, so composite pole testing. Here at RS, our poles were initially tested and characterized using the same horizontal bend test methods as wood. So that would be per ASTM D1036. At RS, we now use vertical test methods. The reason we do that is for P delta performance capturing. Um, oh, just go back one sec, Alex. Most times, uh, folks ask us to, to meet the NCO 5.1 requirements, which is essentially a strength equivalent requirement. So we'll go back to our 50 foot class one wood pole example. Okay. So now we get into why vertical testing. So P delta effect, which I just referred to, is a second order or nonlinear effect of forces on the pole, which is to say if you have a pole, and you put a tip load on it and the pole starts to deflect, when the pole moves off its center axis, the weight of the pole will actually add to additional deflection. It's not much, but it is a component. Horizontal bend tests do not account for P-delta performance, and it's only in vertical full-scale bend tests where you capture the P-delta effect. So how much do wood poles deflect? This table was produced by Powerline Systems, PLS, based on the ANSI 05.1 2017 wood pole mean values. And looking at our 50 foot class one wood pole example, that pole at the 4,500 pound class load will deflect on average about 81 inches or 16% of its above ground height. Again, it's important to note here that these are mean values. So, Let's look at how some actual wood poles tested out when put into a vertical test fixture instead of a horizontal test fixture. All of the other uh, attributes of ASTM D1036 have been followed, and we tested a series of wood poles from 45 up through 55 feet with five specimens at each length. So when we put these five 45 foot class one Western red cedar poles in the full scale tester, we had a deflection range of minus 27 to plus 67% of the mean values. If you look on the graph there, you can see that the blue line, if you will, represents class one mean wood pole performance. Test three on the left of the 45 foot class one wood poles has tested the best. It is not only the stiffest deflecting about 40 inches at, at its factored class load, which is the 3,800 pounds. And by the way, this has been factor to CSA construction grade two. So that's a, a 0.85 factor on the 4,500 pounds of load, which brings us down to about 3,800 pounds. But you can see it broke probably at around 6,000 pounds, it looks there. The other four poles in the test, however, deflected more than the mean performance would have predicted. And three of them didn't even make the factored class load here. And test two landed, looks like somewhere around 4,200 pounds of load. And test five, opposite to test three, was the most deflecting wood pole, if you will, which failed, it looks about 2,500 pounds. And if you carried that on through to class load, it would have been plus 
of the mean performance value. Okay, let's take a look at the 55 or the 50 foot wood poles. So here we have the same sample size, five uh, 50 foot class one western red cedar poles, and the deflection range here, deflection range here, sorry, was minus three to plus 93 percent of mean values. So you can see the class one mean performance here again in the blue, the class, uh, the sorry, the test uh, five pole very closely uh, followed the class one mean performance graph here. And that's about as close as the mean to the mean as you're going to see. Uh, test one, two, three, and four, however, were again far to the right of the mean performance and increasing the deflection, but also falling well short of the class one factored load value. Let's take a look at the 55 foot wood poles here. So the deflection range was a little tighter here, minus 12 to plus 67. Uh, again, you see the class one mean performance line in blue. Test three was the stiffest of the, of the group, uh, but still short of the factored class load. Test five and two did make the factored class load. Uh, test one and four did not. And test four in this instance was the one responsible for the highest deflection. Uh, plus 67% if you carry that through to the factored class low value amount. Okay. So in wood pole equivalency, when someone asks for a 50 foot class one composite pole, what they're really asking for is a strength equivalent request. So they're asking for a composite pole that will take the same load, 4,500 pounds in this case, as the wood pole. Um, however, there is no consideration or guidance for deflection performance. Uh, but what we want to do here in the request for an equi a strength equivalent pole is make sure that the deflection, if you will, is the same for both products. Um, and you will achieve that so that there's no undue stress on the span ahead or the span behind the pole in question that would uh, place undue stress on hardware, so on and so forth, or affect your minimum ground clearance or right of way clearance. So serviceability equivalency is just that. It includes the deflection component of a strength equivalent request. So when a composite pole manufacturer looks to supply a 50 foot class one pole, for example, it will have all the necessary strength required to meet the class one load application, but also deflect in a similar fashion as the wood pole would perform under the same tip load. And again, this goal is for homogeneous deflection performance between wood and composite poles in the grid. So how does composite pole testing actually compare to the wood pole testing we've observed? So here you can see a graph again, we'll just focus on the 50 foot class one Western red cedar example. Uh, here you see the blue uh, class one mean performance value. And we've overlaid the composite pole performance of three RS modular composite poles in this graph to give some comparison relative to the performance of the wood poles. Now, one standard practice in the industry is to take the class one mean performance of a wood pole and use that as an absolute deflection limit for composite poles. If we were to do this in this application, we would be selecting the composite pole farthest to the left here, the grayish line uh, with the characters 0406-C at the end of the uh, pole code description there. That's a module four, five, six pole, 50 feet long. And here you can see that it is certainly stiffer than the class one mean performance of those Western red cedar poles and also significantly stronger. Um, this would be an erroneous assumption though to believe that we should use these wood pole mean performance values as the absolute deflection limit for composite poles. And what we're going to explore here is in fact the using a uh, mean performance of wood poles to inform a composite pole deflection limit um, and taking a look at the performance of a 50 foot 0205 modular composite pole. Okay, Alex. So here we have two photos. The photo on the left is a 50 foot class one Western red cedar pole. And the photo on the right is an 0205 50 foot RS composite pole. 
this is at the start of the test. Uh, these are the same test fixture, but two tests uh, done individually, of course. And we've just taken the screen captures from the test videos to compare the load and the deflection performance of both poles. So let's go to 25% of class load, which is about 900 pounds. So in this instance, uh, we've got the wood pole here on the left. And in the red text on the bottom, you can see that the tip deflection is about 26 inches or about 5% of the poles above ground height. And the ANSI 05.1 mean value is about 17.1 inches. So about two thirds, if you will, of the observed deflection of that wood pole at 25% of the class one load. The RS composite pole on the right, uh, again, same load, is deflecting about 17.1 inches, which is actually right in line with the ANSI uh, predicted values of, of wood poles, or about 3% if it's above ground height. Okay, Alex? Now we've got about 1,900 pounds of load, or 50% of the class one load, and the wood pole you can see is a tip deflection of about 51 inches, uh, so trending, again, about a third or so higher uh, than the ANSI predicted values, uh, and that's equal to about 10% of the poles above ground height. And over on the right, we have the RS composite pole that has a, again, tip deflection of 34.1 inches or just below the mean anti value deflection uh, values. And the deflection of, of above ground height, sorry, is 7%. Okay. So here we are at 75% of class one load or just shy of 2,900 pounds. And the tip deflection is 77 inches on the uh, Western Red Cedar Pole, which is about 50% more than the predicted ANSI value of 51 inches, and that's 15% of its above ground height. And on the right, the RS Composite Pole, we have it about 51 inches. So again, trending just along that ANSI mean value line, and that's 10% of that uh, Composite Pole's above ground height. Now the next one, is not 100% of load, it is 86.4% of class one load, and this is where this pole started to break. Now, just for reference, this uh, Western Red Cedar class one pole is, is test two of the poles, which is sort of in the middle cluster, if you will, of the wood poles that were sampled in that uh, sample set of five. The tip deflection here is about 90 inches, uh, almost, uh, well, exactly 50% more than the predicted ANSI values of 60 inches. And that represents uh, an above ground height uh, percentage of 17. Over on the right, the RS composite pole, tip deflection is 59 inches, so right in line again with the ANSI predicted values, and that's 11% of its above ground height. And here we have the last shot of the wood pole on the left just before it failed. So failure load was about 3,600 pounds, or 94% of the class one load. And again, the deflection is still about the same as the previous slide, so 90 inches, give or take. And the ANSI 05.1 deflection predicted value is about 65 inches. Uh, so you're about 25% higher deflection there. And the RS composite pole over on the right at, again, 94% of class one load is deflecting just lower than the ANSI predicted value for the uh, for wood. And the percentage of AGH or above ground height is 12%. And just before we go to the next slide, Alex, I should say that uh, it's quite typical for us to, uh, in the composite pole world at least, to speak to deflection as a percentage of the above ground height. So that's typically how we refer to these uh, deflection performance values uh, relative to other pole materials. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And here we have an actual factored uh, class one load per CSA grade two construction. And the tip deflection is 68.3 inches, which is 13%. So right about on trend again with what the mean value is of the, um, of the ANSI 05.1 predicted values. And what we see here, typically the published values of the RS composite pole performances are higher than the actual performance. So you're seeing a little bit more conservative uh, deflection performance here than what was published in the tables, uh, which is typical throughout the range. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And this is the last shot of the composite pole before it failed at uh, just shy of 9,900 pounds of tip load, which is about 2.6 times uh, the class one factored load. 
And at this, uh, you know, high load, the tip deflection was 177 inches of the composite pole and the above ground height deflection percentage was 34. So where does this take us? This takes us to deflection premium. Now I'm gonna do my best not to read directly here, but a lot of information to unpack. So the ANSI 5.1 wood pole metrics are mean performance values and not absolute. Uh, actual class one Western red cedar performance, uh, deflection performance range that we observed in testing was minus 27 up to plus 93% of predicted mean values. So as a result of this, we know that mean wood pole values need to inform composite pole deflection limits, but not in fact the absolute limits. Considering the observed wood pole performance, a 30% deflection premium on the mean wood pole deflection value is acceptable based on the tighter coefficient of variation or COV of an engineered product. Of course, the bell curve distribution of strength and stiffness of wood poles will be much greater because it's a natural product. With a composite pole deflection limit of 30%, there will still be wood poles in the population that will deflect more than that composite pole will. And this is mainly, uh, again, just so everyone is aware, applicable to tangent self-supporting poles. On guide poles where you're at an angle or a dead end, those guys will restrict that pole tip movement. Um, and so deflection isn't an issue at that point. Okay, Alex. So looking at a deflection premium calculation, if it's predicted just for easy math, that a wood pole would deflect 15% if it's above ground height at class load, and we're targeting a deflection premium of 30%, we would take 30% of 15%, which is 4.5%, and we would add those two together to result in a absolute deflection value limit of a composite pole at class load of 19.5% compared to the 15% uh, that would be the mean performance value of wood. So there again, you're getting most of the wood pole performance still within that uh, cluster. There, again, there will be a sample of the wood pole population that falls still well outside of that 19.5% of um, above ground height deflection performance. But by limiting the composite pole deflection limit to this 30% premium, as an example, we do achieve the goal of homogeneous grid performance. And those two poles, the wood and the composite pole, will deflect or perform similarly um, as best as can be uh, pre engineered under the same tip load. So in conclusion, uh, just a few points here. Because they are a natural product, wood poles have a large coefficient of variation compared to a tighter coefficient of variation for an engineered composite pole. When testing, poles oriented vertically will deflect more than those oriented horizontally because of the P-delta effect, which is a very important component. And ultimately the vertical testing is representative of how the pole is installed in the field and a much better predictor of actual pole performance when a tip load is applied. Using mean wood pole deflection values as absolute deflection limits for composite poles does not achieve homogeneous grid performance. Instead, we look to establishing serviceability equivalency with a deflection premium. In this case, 30% was an excellent example of how we can achieve that. And that's it for us. Thank you for the opportunity to present, and we welcome any questions at this time, Alex. I think you're muted there, Alex. I swear it's auto. <laughs> Thanks, Galen. Great presentation, learned a lot. Uh, I remind everyone that you can put your questions into the chat function and we will get to them. And I will start us off. And I guess this is definitely a, a teed up one for you, Galen, but unless someone's building a new subdivision, they're not putting in all one type of pole. Poles are replaced piecemeal generally through the lifespan of any section of the grid. So, uh, specifically, how would a procurement individual at any utility assess a composite pole 
and how to best place it into service if, for instance, uh, one of their wood poles was hit by a truck. So this speaks very much well to your uh, premium, but could you go into that a bit more? Certainly, and just to understand correctly, so the question is, if a line is existing and, and already out in, in, in the field for some time and they want someone wants to replace a single pole on that line, what's the process for that? Yeah. So typically what we would do, and again, reverting back to our 50 foot uh, class one wood pole example, if it's a line of 50 foot uh, class one wood poles, uh, they would typically uh, come to RS with a request to replace that. And again, we understand that that's a strength equivalent request. And we would then say, okay, understanding your request. And uh, at that time, we would also take a, a moment to obviously learn about the parameters of the line, where it's located, um, if it's an urban or rural setting, so on and so forth. But essentially, we would go through that process uh, that we've just described. And uh, we've already, uh, if you will, reviewed that and, and baked into our uh, engineering analysis, the deflection understanding and uh, of wood poles and the deflection requirement for a composite pole. So we will return to them a pole that is meets the class one uh, wood pole requirements, but also will deflect or perform in the same way under load as that wood pole uh, would to achieve that uh, serviceability equivalency requirement that we were speaking of. Okay, thank you. I'm starting to get some questions coming in from the audience. The first one goes to you, Dimitri. What was the sampling procedure for the wood poles? Were those brands new? In fact, those ones were. So those were poles that were just were procured on the open market. And uh, we just put the order in for those 15 wood poles and they were delivered. So certainly uh, a, a sampling of different suppliers of Western red cedar poles, for example, would need to be taken into consideration. Uh, but those ones were effectively procured uh, from the same place at the same time. Okay. So what you're seeing is significant variation even within one order. Yes, and that's typical of what you'd see with a natural product like wood, again, with the larger coefficient of variation compared to an engineered product. Okay, I'm going, uh, for next question, I'm gonna condense a few of them. These come in from uh, David McKenzie and Casey Malone, but uh, can you speak to the resilience of composite poles? Uh, woodpeckers, fire, uh, salt resistance and other environmental just wear and tear, really. Okay, uh, just uh, just made some notes here. So, uh, great question. Uh, make sure I address all of them. Um, maybe just start uh, with an easy one. So, salt. Um, the RS wood poles, uh, they don't have any coatings or paint on the outside. So, there's nothing to wear off or wear down over time. And in fact, it's a it's a surface finish, if you will, that is good for the life of the pole and requires no scheduled maintenance. Um, because of that, it maintains its uh, hydrophobic qualities over the life of the over the surface life of the pole. So, in other words, it'll maintain its self-washing characteristics over its surface life, and it's impervious to uh, salt. So it's great for Canadian installations where you're going to be close to a road where they use salt or brine for um, ice control in the winter and coastal applications. Um, anytime the precipitation hits the pole, the pole will be self-washed and that salt will just wash away. Uh, with woodpeckers, of course, uh, that's one of the biggest uses of our product uh, in the utility industry uh, is woodpecker pole remediation. So many utilities that we work with are not using the uh, woodpecker patch or the, the hole filler, if you will, um, if a wood pole has a woodpecker holes in it, they'll just take that pole out and replace it with a composite pole and be done with the problem. Uh, the same is true we're also seeing for carpenter ants. Uh, for fire, that's a great uh, question. Going back to 2011, there weren't any real tests in the utility industry to uh, simulate forest fire on a pole. And RS worked with the University of Alberta um, fire expert Mark Ackerman to develop a test that would be representative of a forest fire moving through a utility line right of way. So Mark Ackerman designed a heat profile and duration that would simulate this fire and then we full scale tested it. And we've completed that test uh, probably about uh, at six different occasions, uh, testing dozens of poles. And the test method actually is we take a, we take a pole, it's embedded in the ground, a large steel sheath is on it, 
these flames are fed uh, into this sheet for either two or three minute durations. Um, then the flame is turned off, the pole is self-extinguishing in the fire, and then we put the, uh, the pole, we take it out of the ground, put it in the pole scale uh, tester, and then we test the pole to quantify any loss of uh, strength or stiffness. Um, on a two minute fire test, the pole uh, performs excellently. It is self-extinguishing, and we see a, a modest uh, reduction in the strength of the pole, but the pole still tests above its published strength values. On a three minute test, we, ask, we also have a fire shield that we can put on the pole to give the pole a little bit added protection. Um, and on the three minute test with the fire shield, the pole does the same thing. Uh, typical residence times for a crown fire are about 40 to 60 seconds. Uh, so that three minute test is really an extreme test. And we, we have seen all those utilities that uh, are on the West Coast that are affected by all the fires that we're seeing the smoke of here, even in Ontario, um, have transitioned uh, to composite poles to mitigate their risk of fire to the wood pole grid. So slowly but surely, many of these wood poles are being changed out for composite poles. Okay. Uh, getting a lot of questions. You definitely have an engaged audience. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> synthesize a few more together. Uh, these ones come from Elaine and Brian. Uh, are composite poles suitable for floodplain installation? Specifically, are there environmental and are there any environmental concerns uh, with whatever chemicals are in the wood poles for installation near water? So that's been another area where a lot of utilities have used our product are in, in sensitive uh, environmental areas like wetlands, floodplains, swamps, um, where there's a lot of um, uh, life that can be harmed by dangerous chemicals. Um, Creosote, the, et cetera. So on and so forth, exactly. So composite poles are inert. Um, so basically, I've got a piece of the pole here. Um, so nothing comes out of that pole. So it's the best solution, if you will, to be able to be used in those environmentally sensitive areas, not only because nothing leaches out of this pole, um, but for two other reasons. One is because it has uh, its hydrophobic qualities. The water can't get into it, so it'll last a long time, um, but also because of its weight. At about one third the weight of a wood pole or one tenth the weight of a concrete pole, for example, the environmental footprint of the equipment that need, is needed to install these poles in those environmentally sensitive areas, it's much less. So your resulting impact through the installation process is also lower than you would with a, with a heavier pole product, if you will. Okay. And now I'm see, seeing a couple questions come in where we're getting into the brass tacks, so to speak. What is the cost difference between a composite and wood pole? And to also th synthesize in some other questions that speak to the same, what is the expected lifespan of each? And uh, uh, yeah, no, I'll save that question for the next one. So yeah, if you could answer that two-parter, please. Well, uh, that's a, the, those are great questions, Alex. And uh, for a long time, we've, we've been asked how much to composite poles cost after this, uh, you know, great value proposition that we built up. Uh, and it's safe to say, and uh, this might catch some people by surprise, that uh, composite poles uh, will be more expensive than wood, steel, or concrete poles. In comparison with wood, they'll typically be about three to five times the cost of a wood pole. The five X factor would be on a smaller pole, say 30 to 40 feet, feet sorry, and then as that uh, length gets larger or taller, that delta, the price delta diminishes. Um, however, Material cost or first price, purchase price, is one component of an installation. And if you look forward, uh, it's where that pole is used that determines the total installed cost and the overall life cycle cost. So just some quick examples. Uh, people use our products in three different applications. One is where other poles don't last as long as they should, okay? Uh, on average, our pole will last for 80 years. And we have the, uh, the UV exposure data, if you will, uh, for ASTM G154 to back that up. And that's where the service has been established. Um, if you've got woodpecker uh, issues, it's not uncommon for a wood pole to be replaced and there to be a dozen new woodpecker holes in that pole a week later. What we're seeing for larger utilities, the cost to replace a pole can be anywhere from 10 to $20,000 for let's say a $500 wood pole. So that's a lot of cost uh, on just an inexpensive wood pole. 
So in that example, let's say it's a smaller 40 foot pole and our pole costs uh, $2,500 or 5X the $500 cost. In that example, it'll be, and let's just use for easy math, $10,000 as a replacement cost. It'll, our pole will be $12,000 to replace versus the $10,000. Um, but that pole, you'll know and have confidence in the fact that a woodpecker is not gonna damage or uh, force the replacement of that pole in the next 80 years. It's not uncommon. In fact, we've been on situations where we've replaced uh, wood poles that have been on average replaced every uh, three years. So in a 15 year period, this one particular installation we were on, that wood pole had been replaced five times. So that's $50,000 in a 15 year period that would just continue in perpetuity, presumably, unless something different was done. And in this instance, the, the difference was they used a composite pole and so they spent $12,000 and then they're done with it now for 80 years. Um, the other place where people use our poles is where, um, if there is such a thing as average installation cost, the installation cost is higher than average. So when you start going off-road by 10 or 20 kilometers or into the swamps or up in the mountains or what have you, um, installation costs incrementally increases. So we've done uh, projects where it's about $70,000 to replace an H-frame structure at 230 kV. Um, we can save a substantial amount of money. Our particular product, uh, we can make a pole, but it's modular, so it can nest. So all of these pieces can nest down into a compact lightweight bundle that can be get in, flown into site or moved into site with a track vehicle that much easier. So the farther you get off road uh, with the installation, the more competitive the installation cost becomes and the composite pole will typically end up paying for itself and more compared to uh, the heavier weight um, incumbents like wood steel and concrete poles. Cool, thank you, Caleb. And I still see a few more co uh, questions coming in, but I still see lots of audience members who haven't asked questions. So please, I encourage you all to put some questions forward. I'm gonna jump in here with one of my own. Uh, this is from some of my own experience in the industry and working on transmission lines. Uh, are your poles compatible with screw pilings and other like non-traditional anchoring systems? So that's a, another great question, Alex. So typically what 90% uh, of the poles or 95% of the poles we install are direct in bed. And if a utility is using the 10% uh, you know, plus two embedment convention, that will work well uh, for a composite pole by and large. Um, as it would happen right now, we are participating in a, uh, a flange design, if you will, that will enable a, a, a tapered steel section to go up inside the pole and they, bolted uh, ring mount here, if you will, on the bottom that you can uh, affix to solid rock or to a helical screw pile uh, for those other types of installations. Uh, we've done some installations on solid rock by building a, um, a rebar cage and then pouring concrete in, in the base module to create a stub and then the top of the pole comes on top. So that's one style we've done. And we've also done other hybrid models where it's been a screw pile with a, uh, a canister on top, if you will, that is driven into the ground, and then the pole actually sits in that canister in the ground. Um, so there's a host of uh, foundation solutions that can be used with the pole. Even Hydro One, for example, has this solution called a Macy pot, which is essentially a, a big steel bucket that the base of the pole would sit in, and then the pole is just guide as a temporary installation. So that's another one that can use in um, it can be used in situations where you just need to to get the line up in the air and up and running again. Yeah, uh, sounds good. And uh, we have a question here from Henry: Is ANSI or CSA looking at adding deflection limits to the standards so wood and non-wood materials will be more interchangeable? That's a great question. Uh, to my knowledge, no, there is no talk of, of CSA or ANSI um, adding any, any deflection limits. So they kind of leave that in, uh, into a, a gray area, if you will. Um, and it's incumbent upon both the line designer and the, if you will, in this case, composite pole manufacturer to understand deflection well enough to be able to discuss it and, uh, and mutually agree upon the best course of action um, for a given installation. Um, you know, relating back to the presentation, we've established serviceability equivalency requirements uh, for composite pole selection compared to the wood pole classes. So we have that as kind of a baseline standard. Um, but of course, 
everything is custom configurable to a specific application and we can alter that if, if need be. Very good. Uh, another question in from Elaine. Are there limits on the amount of post installation drilling that can take place? And I believe this is talking about uh, primarily telecommunication attachments or other attachments to the pole. Yeah, another good question. Uh, our recommendation is that for in a given section that any two holes be six times the diameter apart from one another. So easy math, if you have a half inch hole that needs to be three inches apart in any axis from another hole. Or if you have a one inch hole that needs to be six inches apart. And typically what we find is most utility hardware is built around those specifications. So for a dead end guide tee, for example, a two bolt dead end guide tee, that will normally require three quarter inch through bolts and uh, 13 16 inch holes in the pole, uh, which will be 60 apart, more than 60 apart at the six inch spacing. Um, so typically we find that most of the hardware abides by the hole spacing requirements that we have. Okay. Uh, this one from Gary. Does your composite product include a percentage of recycled product by default or can that be specified? Unfortunately, it, it, uh, I say unfortunately because everyone would love to say they're using recycled product, but ours cannot. Ours is made from uh, total uh, virgin material, if you will. So virgin glass fiber and, uh, and resin. So in the polymeric or the polymer world, there are two types of uh, general categories that polymers fit into. One is called a thermoplastic, and that's what this, this little pole model is made from. Um, I've also got, for example, a calculator here, and the case of that calculator is a thermoplastic, as is, for example, a water bottle or your car bumper, uh, or the outside of your car bumper, at least. And in those, uh, those types of polymers, thermoplastics, uh, they are recyclable in, in the traditional sense. So you can heat them up, melt them, reshape them, provided there's enough stabilizers, and make something else out of them. Thermosets are a different category of polymer. So you basically, when the, the two components of the resin are reacted together, there's an exothermic reaction, and then that product is set. And with no amount of heat will that product melt and, and be reshapable or reusable, if you will. Um, if enough heat is applied for long enough, that product will char and, uh, and break down, but it's not recyclable in that sense. So unfortunately, with the composite products that are out there, composite cross arms, um, boat hulls, if you will, uh, poles in this instance are not recyclable and do not contain uh, recycled material. And if I was just to, the, the common term then for thermoset is epoxies. Yep, that, that's one example, correct, epoxy resins, yes. Yep. Uh, to Dave McKendry, are special tools like drill bits required? Uh, and I'm guessing this is in response to the question about like uh, drilling anchors. Yep. Yeah, uh, so another great question. So standard, you know, high-speed steel bits that would typically use to say a drill or cut a wood pole uh, cannot really be used on our product because it's it's very abrasive or all comp composite products are very abrasive and it'll dull that high speed steel bit very quickly. So what we recommend uh, for drilling to use a carbide tip hole saw, uh, there's a host of them out there in Milwaukee is one such manufacturer. Um, they're small, they're compact, they're very efficient. You can drill a hole in five to 10 seconds. Um, and that, that hole saw will be good for hundreds if not thousands of holes. And for cutting, we recommend uh, a diamond or a carbide tip blade on a circular saw, and that will that will handily cut a uh, the material uh, quite nicely. A chainsaw, for example, will not. A regular circular saw will not. Um, so on and so forth. So uh, those are all readily available too from a host of uh, manufacturers. Those those tools. Yeah, lots like uh, silicon oxide is sandpaper, really. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, from Mark, what is the recommended reduction in factor of safety for design loading when using composite poles compared to wood poles? Well, the design codes like CSA will specify that, but the material strength factor is 1.0. It's considered an engineered product, just like uh, steel and, and concrete poles are. So there's no uh, factor, if you will, on the, on the published strength of the composite pole. Um, it relies on the manufacturer providing a product that has a 5% lower exclusion limit. Um, and as long as you're 
providing that, then uh, of course you just just design with the code. So it doesn't have those the factors that are applicable to wood, let's say. Okay. Uh, from Henry, the six times hole separation does not work with a typical dead end fiberglass cross arm with three holes. Is there a way to correct this incompatibility? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, let me just refer to my trusty art skills, if you will. Um, so what we could do is, and what we have done in many cases, so if you can use a plate like that, if you can see it, a multi-hole plate, and you would put two bolts of the cross arm through that plate, and it could, I drew a four, it could be a three or what have you. Um, two bolts that do have the six inch required spacing could go through that plate, and then you can use the third bolt for the other bolt, and that just puts that uh, enough space between all the bolts, all three bolts, if you will, to have that uh, that six inch spacing. So you'd cover a 12 inch uh, bolt separation bit in total, and maybe the plate is you know 15, 16 inches long in total. And that could be done, you could put the extra bolt just below or just above the cross arm, the two main bolts that ho would hold the cross arm in place. Very good. Uh, I think you've touched on this already, but uh, how does the weight compare between wood and composite? So typically for the same uh, serviceability equivalent pole, you'll be about one third the weight of a wood pole on average. And that'll, that'll vary wildly, of course. Uh, if the wood pole is brand new and wet, that'll be heavier, so it'll be less than a third. As the, the wood pole dries out and the moisture content reduces, um, on average, it's about a, uh, 30% or 35% of what a wood pole would be. And that, that's about uh, also about half of what a steel pole would be, an equivalent steel pole, and about one-tenth of what a, an equivalent concrete pole would be for weight. Hmm. I, does, and I'll just build on that question. Does that translate into any cost savings for installation for helicopter assisted installations? Yeah, that's and that's one thing. So getting back to the cost of installation, uh, if you have a remote install up in the mountains or, or off road and that you would otherwise have to build a road to or lay down, you know, two miles of swamp matting to get to, most people don't associate the use of helicopters with cost savings. But in those types of installations, uh, the weight of a composite pole can actually facilitate that. So uh, drawing on two, two examples, one of which is, is relevant here, um, there's a Canadian utility that uses an A-Star B-13 helicopter that has a lift capacity of about 2,200 pounds. A 90-foot class two composite pole weighs about 1,900 pounds. So they can lift a single 90-foot pole in with this rather small helicopter and place that pole. So you're not building a road, you're not having to go in, and you can set that pole literally, once the hole is, is dug and in place, you can set that pole in about two minutes. Um, there was a project that we were involved with over in Scotland where it was 140 structures. These were 90, 95 foot H-frame structures that were very heavy because they had a lot of steel cross arms uh, on them. Um, the terrain in Scotland is, is challenging to say the least. And this helicopter installed these 140 structures. Mind you, all the foundations had been preset or pre-dug and sleeved, so the poles could just be dropped in. But they set 140 structs, H-frame structures in three days, which was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when it, when it comes to the weight, that does facilitate the use of helicopters. And again, um, there are some utilities that are using helicopters and some that are not, uh, but certainly with a with a two or three minute installation time, it can really cut down on the time and the cost compared to do, to traditional tr uh, construction methods for sure. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one. Going back to you, Elaine, has the center column internal to the pole been used to run cable or fiber? It has. Um, most of our installations are overhead line applications, so transmission, distribution, what have you. Uh, but we also, in any given year, do five, sometimes even up to 10% historically in communication applications. Um, and in those applications, uh, the cables can be run either externally or internally. And even on uh, overhead line applications, it's not uncommon for, if this is the pole, the ground wire to come down to, say, 10 feet above ground line, go in the pole, and 
carry down out through the bottom of the pole um, inside. And that'll protect it from theft or otherwise uh, tampering with the ground line. Um, but it, yes, uh, for communication applications, that is where we see most of the internal uh, cable runs. Um, and because it is, of course, hollow, um, you have the opportunity to do that. And those cables would hang inside from a, from a hanger bolt at the top of the pole, and everything would be otherwise concealed and protected from the elements. Cool. Uh, question from a new, uh, new person here. This is over to you, Bern. Uh, how, can, how, how do people climb these poles? Like spurs, like the normal wood pole, <laughs> or do they need special equipment and training? Uh, they are actually climbable, and they're climbed the same way that one would climb a, a concrete or a steel pole, which is to say we use steps. Uh, so there are a host of manufacturers, probably half a dozen manufacturers, that offer uh, various step or climbing options. Um, the most uh, common one is a, is a single shank, and it's uh, one hole that's drilled in the pole wall, and it's a bent shank at the end, so it just goes up into the hole. It's an external uh, piece that's fastened on there, um, and that's how they climb them. I'm just looking to see if I have, there's one example. And you can see a, a climber there with steps in the belt. Um, one quick question before I have uh, somewhat of a canned one to see you off. Uh, how well do these things hold up to car crashes comparable to a wood pole? Is it like you presented, you gave us a presentation that they're 2.6 times stronger in that class category. Uh, is the same true for, I guess, blunt force trauma, AKA a car crash? Yeah, uh, so they actually perform uh, well, which is to say they're probably the safest thing you can hit if you're in a car. Um, the pole will collapse around the car and it's not uncommon. We've even seen applications where if the car is, hits it straight, straight on enough and it's going fast enough to shear the pole right off at ground line. Now the benefit is because the pole is so lightweight in those instances that we're aware of, the pole has never, uh, I'll use this one, never, never come down catastrophically. It's been held up by the conductor and the pole on either side of it. So even when it's, when it's been taken off, um, it hasn't fallen down to the ground. Um, the material, uh, because it, uh, we have what we call a filament wound pole with both circumferential and axial fibers, um, the, any initial damage will, will not propagate because it's confined in that local area. But again, anything that's big enough, traveling fast enough, hitting it directly enough will damage the material and even potentially shear it off. Um, now, having said that again, because of its lightweight, it doesn't come down catastrophically. And because the, although not a certified insulator, the pole is uh, a dielectric, if you will. Yeah, non-conductive. And so you don't get fault current typically traveling down the pole, uh, which is another concern, of course, especially if you hit a steel pole, as an example. Cool. Uh, so last question before we close today, and I, and I know I haven't gotten everyone's questions, but please feel free to reach out to Galen. His, email and uh, phone number is posted here and you will receive a recording of this webinar but uh, you've spoken how uh, composite poles are fire resistant they have a exceeding strength long lifespan uh, given all the uncertainties of climate change over the next 50 years uh, do you see your composite poles or composite poles in general as being critical to grid resiliency in an ever-changing climate uh, we certainly have that opinion. Um, you know, going back to the price, we appreciate that um, it does cost more than wood. On a total installed cost basis, you're only 20, 25% more than a wood pole. But we still appreciate that that's still a bump over uh, what what standard budgets are. Um, certainly, we recognize that uh, you know composite poles aren't going to replace every wood pole that's out there. Uh, but in terms of a strategy specifically designed around grid hardening and resiliency, um, composite poles are, are a vital component of that. And I think that, uh, it, you know, in reality, every electrical line is important, but if utilities can apply composite poles uh, as a more resilient, uh, longer lasting uh, grid hardening component, uh, they can do so strategically on these strategic, maybe radial lines as an example, 
uh, where we see a lot of folks using them is on uh, high value equipment structures. So where you have, um, you know, switches and whatnot, uh, transformer banks, anything like that, where you've got high value equipment, better to use a, a resilient composite pole versus a wood pole that might be on the lower end of that, um, those wood pole performance values. Um, and certainly in applications where you're looking for a non-conductive product, let's say we've done a, an installation where we did uh, the utility needed a non-conductive pole because it was in a gas pipeline shared right away. So they, they couldn't have a conductive option. So in those types of uh, applications, absolutely it's uh, it's a spot to use composite poles as part of the overall strategy. Cool. Thank you, Galen. And thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to attend this webinar. I remind you that you can see past webinars. Uh, the information was posted to the chat. And you can see upcoming webinars by going to www.electricity.ca, the news and events section of our website. Thank you, everyone, again, for your time. And thank you, Galen, for teaching us more about composite polls. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Alex.